Right. Hello, friends. Hello, everybody. I am so excited for our event tonight. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation on a subject that is so near and so dear to my heart, home and community-based services. I am Elena Hung. I am the co-founder and executive director of Little Lobbyists, a family-led group advocating for children with complex medical needs and disabilities. I am also sometimes better known as Xiomara's mom. Xiomara just turned seven last week, seven. And I am thrilled to tell you that she is thriving today. She is happy, kind, and funny, clever, and just a little bit naughty. She recently graduated from first grade and she loves to play and read books and paint and have fun and just be a kid. None of this was ever guaranteed to us. So seven years ago, I had a great pregnancy and an amazing birth. And then 15 minutes after she was born, Diomara was placed on 100% oxygen support and rushed to the neonatal intensive care unit where she remained for the next five months of her life. She was diagnosed with serious medical conditions affecting her airway, her lungs, her heart, her kidneys. She uses a tracheostomy to breathe, a ventilator for additional respiratory support, a feeding tube for all of her nutrition, and a wheelchair to get around and explore the world around her. Yamara is the joy of my life, and I am so lucky that I get to be her mom, and I am so grateful for the home and community-based services that has helped her survive and thrive here at home with her family and a community who loves her. We would not be here today without home and community-based services, without the HCBS, without the therapies, the, the physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy and feeding therapy that has helped foster her independence. Um, she wouldn't be here today without the home skilled nursing that has kept her safe and healthy. So this issue, as you can tell, is just so personal and so real to me um, and to so many families like mine. We have an amazing opportunity today to do something really great for disabled kids like Yamara, for disabled adults um, and for seniors, really for everyone. So, but enough about we have an exciting, exciting program tonight um, and we We'll hear from some of our partners in Congress who have been fighting for families like mine uh, who and workers um, who rely on home and community-based services to survive and thrive, fighting for a living wage for our workers to care for our loved ones. Um, and I am so, so excited to introduce uh, Senator Duckworth, Senator from Illinois, who previously represented the 8th District of Illinois for two terms in the U.S. Representative Con uh, House of Representatives. She's an Iraq War a veteran, a Purple Heart recipient, a hero to so many of us. Senator, we're so grateful for your voice in the Senate. Um, on a personal note, I want to say that it is so meaningful to me to... Um, for my daughter, to uh, a disabled Asian American girl, to have the opportunity to grow up and see herself represented, to see herself, uh, someone who looks like her, belonging in positions of power, belonging in Congress. You're a role model to so many of us. And thank you for that, because this is what it's really all about, right? Home and Community Services is about belonging and seeing ourselves represented. Um, to feel like we belong. HCBS is saying to seniors, saying to children with disabilities, saying to adults with disabilities, you belong in our community. You belong here now, especially now. So we are thrilled to hear your thoughts um, about why this issue is so important to you and how would expanding home and community-based services help get American families back on their feet given everything that we've been through this past year and a half during the pandemic. So, love to hear from you. Thank you, Senator. Thank for you. Us. Hi, Elena, and, and, and a shout out to my good friend, uh, Congresswoman Debbie Dingle, who's also on this call. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here and, and to be chatting with everybody. And I'm happy to have the opportunity to do this virtually with everyone. We're actually in the middle of a bunch of floor votes on the Senate right now. So you see me and Senator Casey popping in and out as we're trying to make it back and forth through all of our votes. 
Um, listen, if we've learned anything from the COVID pandemic, it's that there is an urgent need to ensure that all Americans, particularly seniors and persons with disabilities, have the option to receive quality care in the setting of their choice, such as in their homes and in their communities, and to ensure that caregivers receive fair wages and benefits. Um, you know, I always say that the caregivers are, are, you know, they take care of the most precious things in, in your life, either your children or your loved one with a disability or your, or your elderly relatives. Why do we not pay them uh, a, a prevailing wage and, 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 and compensate them uh, to reflect the preciousness of the people that they take care of? Um, over three and a half million older adults and people with disabilities receive Medicaid home and community-based services. Um, but due to years of underinvestment, over 800,000 Americans, 800,000 Americans are still waiting to receive HCBS services. And the average wait time is more than three years, which is an eternity when you're living, especially with complex medical needs. We need home care workers more than ever before, but it's really hard to build and maintain a strong workforce when home care jobs are plagued, as I said, by chronic low pay, few or, or no workplace protections and often don't offer you the choice of joining a union for some union protections. That's why I was really proud to help Senator Casey introduce the Better Care, Better Jobs Act. This legislation carries forward President Biden's bold vision to expand access to quality care, better pay and benefits for workers and to create jobs for our economy. It includes President Biden's $400 billion investment in home and community-based services, which would not only help Americans who wish to live at home and in their communities, but it would also serve as a targeted jobs program for some of the very workers who were hardest hit by the economic recession. This legislation would also build on a 12.7 billion down payment that passed as part of the American Rescue Plan um, that bolsters long-term care today and well into the future. Look, bottom line, we've got to do better to help ensure that Americans with disabilities and older Americans have quality long-term care and that home care workers are paid fair wages and, and, and receive fair benefits. This is our moment of opportunity. I'm so excited to be here, be here because this is a moment of opportunity. And I'm so glad to join you in trying to get this work done. Again, thank you everyone on this call for everything that you do. I'm happy to hear any questions and I might have to run off to go vote and come back but I'm really looking forward to the question and answer portion as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Duckworth. That's, that was wonderful. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your partnership and all of this. And you're right, we have to do better. And that's why we are all here. Um, I am now excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Senator Bob Casey from the great state of Pennsylvania. Casey serves on four committees. He is the chairman of the Special Committee on Aging, where he focuses on policies that support seniors and people with disabilities. Um, I'm going to get a little sentimental here, Senator Casey, if you may. We met back in 2017 during the health care repeal fight. Um, we started talking about Medicaid, and since then we have had countless conversations and meetings talking about how important this issue is. You have been a champion for, for families in Pennsylvania, who we'll hear from later on, from, from Victoria and her son, Cole, uh, but also for families across the country. You have seen, you have seen my daughter, Yamara, grow up these past four years, and you've seen the benefits of home and community-based services for kids like her, the benefits of the therapies and, and, and the home nursing care that she's received to keep her safe. Um, I remember the first time we came to see you and she was just sitting there very quietly <laughs> um, in the corner. And the last time we saw you, she was running all over your office and, you know, <laughs> being really, really loud. And, and you know, that's, it's, it's been such an amazing ride. And I just want to say that I am so grateful for your leaderships and, and we're so excited to hear from you. Um, so could you, could you tell us a bit more about the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, why you are fighting so hard for it and what we, uh, to all of us listening here tonight, what we can do to help make sure that Congress passes this funding to ensure that we invest in the home and community-based services. Well, Elena, thanks so much. And thanks for bringing not only your passion, but your personal story. And I, I can say without any fear of contradiction that if you and so many other moms, and mostly it was moms, uh, and, and those who, who made up uh, the little lobbyists, if you didn't come forward 
in 2017 like you did, uh, the ACA would have been wiped out. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that um, the work that was done by the disability community was the decisive reason we defeated that repeal. And um, this, this fight we're in right now is a different kind of battle because it's a battle to make progress, not just a battle to stop as we were in 2017, trying to stop a bad thing from happening. And so I'm grateful that uh, I have a chance to join you and so many others. I know we will hear later from Victoria and Colin and Jeff and so many others, but I'm always honored to be with United States Representative Debbie Dingell, who's been uh, laboring in these vineyards. Debbie might know where that phrase is in the Bible. I don't, but I, I know the phrase, <laughs> but she's been working uh, on this issue for a long time and leading the effort in the house, bringing also her personal story uh, of caregiving that um, I think so many Americans can identify with. And I wanna be mindful of her time. We're, as, as uh, Senator Duckworth just told you, she's moving to the second vote and, and I will be as well. But I wanna thank you for the work, everyone, for the work that you've done to, to get us to this point where the Better Care, Better Jobs legislation is not only a bill, not only a bill su supported by 40 United States senators and, and great support in the House with Debbie's leadership, but also is going to be the centerpiece of the effort that uh, we've undertaken to have legislation passed to, to help a lot of families on, in a lot of different ways. And one of them is to help our families have more opportunities to have the benefit of home and community-based services for seniors, for people with disabilities, and also to lift up, to lift up this workforce, which we always knew was essential, mostly women, of course, mostly women of color, paid only $12 an hour. How can we say that they're essential when we pay them uh, only $12 an hour? How can we say in the grip of, in the aftermath of a pandemic, that they were heroic if we're not going to pay them uh, a wage that's, uh, that's uh, consistent, not only with the, the life-saving work that they do, but consistent with American values. Uh, it's it's un-American to, uh, to not make this investment, in my judgment. Some may think that's pretty harsh, but I don't really care. We, we're, we're in a fight here to get this done, and we're going to push very hard and not yield until we get this done. Because th this is the kind of America we see. A better America, as, as President Biden has said over and over again, build back better. Um, that means in the caregiving context, having the best care in the world um, for seniors, for people with disabilities, and, and all those tens and tens of millions of family caregivers that often have no help certainly no help from Washington as they take on very uh, significant caregiving challenges in their own families. So it's better jobs for home, so home care workers, better care for, of course, seniors and people with disabilities, and, and better support for uh, family caregivers. So we're at the beginning of a long journey, not by years, but by weeks, certainly, where we're going to be working in the Senate Democratic Caucus to to move forward uh, this policy as part of a larger effort to invest in our families and to, to build back better. I might even add the word much before the word better uh, because that's, that's what uh, Democrats believe in. We wish of course that Republicans would join us in this as they, they, some of them seem to wanna join us in the Senate on the physical infrastructure, but uh, caregiving is essential and we've gotta make sure that uh, we move this forward. So. I want to thank you and, and um, all at, at, um, at Little Lobbyists and Beyond for the great advocacy that you've undertaken on behalf of so many tens and tens of millions of Americans who will benefit. And I get, again, I want to thank Senator Duckworth for her leadership and, and my friend and colleague, uh, Debbie Dingell. Thank you so much, Senator. You're Wonderful, thank you. We're just so, so grateful to be in this fight with you by our side. Um, I'll just echo what you just said. It's un-American 
to not make this investment. And that's just absolutely true. If, if we're not fighting for this, then what are we fighting for, right? That's that's the question. So thank you so much for, for your leadership and your partnership and your friendship and throughout all of this. I am so, so excited uh, for our next speaker, um, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, who like Senator Casey just said, has been in this fight every step of the way, a leader and a partner every step of the way. Uh, Representative Dingell serves the 12th District of Michigan in the House of Representatives. Fantastic through all of this. Her staff is fantastic, I can say that. Um, so Congressman, you have had, um, personal experience with long-term care system in that your husband had a home caregiver and we'd love to hear from you um, what some of the joys and challenges uh, that you experienced throughout this process and that's um, and how we can help to ensure that all families are supported during this process um, and the importance of home and community-based services for all Americans. We're so excited to have your voice here tonight and, and throughout this fight. Congresswoman? Well, first of all, Elena, thank you so much. And I just want to say to the little lobbyists, I love you. I would much rather sit on the floor and play with the kids than listen to any of the adults that ever walk into my office. You are uh, the most effective tool we have to get the message through. And I thank you for what you do every day. And I tell you, it's not, John Dingle loved you too. Um, he, he, would, he would say to me, I gotta get the little obvious. So I just wanna thank everybody who is one of the voices that really does make a difference and people can't not listen to you. So, uh, so thanks for having me here. And the challenges that we we're talking about today and we're gonna hear from other people are exactly why Senator Case, Casey, Senator Duckworth and I are pushing for better, better accessible long-term care. And I couldn't have two better partners. Senator Casey is just, I probably shouldn't say this, sometimes you talk to senators and they're a little not in touch. <laughs> Senator Casey is the most in touch. So Senator Duckworth, we're, you're working with two champions who understand they don't give up they stay in the ring and they are fighting. And I, I couldn't have a better partner than uh, Senator Casey. And I'm, we've even become really good friends over all of us. And it just means a lot. And I've known Senator Duckworth since before I came to Congress and she's just a really good person. And so I'm really proud to be here with both of them. But as you talked about Elena, this issue is deeply personal for me. I've been a caregiver. And quite frankly, it was that experience of being a caregiver. And I'm lucky, I'm lucky, let me be clear, the 99 and nine tenths of the people in this country. And when John got sick, um, he actually finished his life's work on a Thursday night. And the doctor put him in the hospital that Friday and told me he thought he had finished his life's work and that he might die that weekend. And that began my journey into a very broken, fractured healthcare system. With a man, by the way, who was very independent. I mean, he did live for another four years. And each of those years brought new trials and new challenges. He was very stubborn, very independent, stubborn to the day he died. But I would just trying to find help, trying to figure out who was covering what. You know, I sat on the phone one day and recorded how many times I talked to a recording and I finally, I just broke down into tears and knocked my head on the wall. I didn't know what to do. So I know how broken this long-term care system is. And I was lucky enough that John was able to stay at home. Um, but more people should be able to do that without going through the experiences that too many of us go through or sitting on waiting lists or balancing being that family caregiver or having to make a decision about whether to put food on the table. We've seen the fractures in our society surface even more and more people pay attention to them with this pandemic, especially within the care system. And let's be honest, sometimes we just have to talk this way. It's hurting our economy, our seniors and people with disabilities and our workers. And we just, the times now that we've got to do something about it. 
To me, it's very simple. Seniors and people with disability deserve to live with dignity and in safety. And care, care workers deserve adequate benefits and pay for the work that they do. And right now, our long-term care system doesn't meet those unique needs. So that's what we're talking about today. In fact, more than 800,000 Americans are currently on the home community-based uh, services list, waiting list, where they were on it before the pandemic. That number has probably grown. We're trying to get the latest number because they wanted to live in the setting that they chose. They wanted to be at home. They wanted to be in their community. They wanted to be with people they knew. They wanted to be where they feel comfortable. They wanna be what they've known all of their life. And so right now, over half of Americans who are 65 or older will require long-term care at some point. And there are millions of Americans with disability who also need help with this care. And long-term care is a huge preference. AARP cites that nine out of 10 Americans would prefer home and community-based care over institutional care. I mean, who wouldn't? Who wants to be in some sterile place where they're part of a, you wanna be in what you call home. On the other hand, families have to choose between too many essentials, between childcare and work, between keeping their family healthy and paying bills, and nearly 3 million women, mostly women of color, have had to drop out of the workforce during the pandemic because of these difficult choices. So many of our care workers in child care and home care also continued in the workforce amidst health risks and limited benefits. And they didn't have PPE equipment either. And what really makes me sad, and I really spent a lot of time both with caregivers while John was alive, and with caregivers now, and they're working two, three, four jobs, and they're still living below the poverty line. So Senator Casey talked about last month, we introduced the historic Better Care, Better Jobs Act to expand the home and community-based services so that seniors and people with dis disabilities can get the care they need in the setting of their choice. And along with that, we wanna make sure care workers are receiving the pay and benefits that are, rep that are representative of their work. So the bill is what President Biden's, we talked about last year. It's his $400 billion home and community care proposal. And we wanna make sure that it's gonna pass. We know it works. And let me talk to you about another program. We've also helped lead efforts to extend the Money Follows the Person program to help more people transition to home or community-based settings. Since its inception, the Money Follows the, the Person program has helped more than 100,000 seniors and people with disabilities move out of nursing homes and other institutions and into the community. And we need to make this permanent. I'm tired of fighting for it each year. It's not just a niche issue. It's affecting too many people across the country. So as part of our nation's infrastructure, we need to improve the pay and benefits of the long-term care workforce while expanding access to services for people with disabilities and for seniors. We've got the support of so many of you and we just have to keep this fight going. Caregiving allows for all other work to be possible. It gets seniors and people with disabilities the support they need to live with dignity and independence in their home and in their communities. It's the foundation of our economy. I'm so grateful that you all are working with us and we gotta stay together and together, we're gonna bring this over the finish line. Thanks, Elena. Thank you, thank you, Congresswoman. That was just perfect. You're right, this is so personal. This is so real and we all, all of us with dignity, with safety, independence, our workers deserve a living wage and their benefits. So thank you. We will thank you. We will continue this fight. And I do uh, want to say I'm excited that Colin is going to Colin's going to be speaking because he's from my home state of Michigan, and he is just an example of people that make a difference by telling their stories. So I'm really excited to be with him too. 
Hey, we all are, and that's a perfect transition. Colin, Colin um, attends Eastern Michigan University um, and has used home and community-based services through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services waiver for people with developmental disabilities. We are so, so grateful that Colin is here to share his experience. So uh, let me just, just turn it over to Colin right now. Hi, Colin, welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm I'm honored to share um, my experience with home and community-based programs. Uh, I'm fortunate to have two distinct great college experience. I started at Washtenaw Community College, uh, and then after I graduated from there, I've been attending Eastern Michigan University since the fall of 2017. Uh, Community Living Services through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has made it possible for me to move out of my parents' home and live on campus in the dorm, just like everyone else. Well, not exactly like everyone else. Uh, I'm a power wheelchair user and I need quite a bit of support with everyday tasks others take for granted. Some of these tasks include um, getting dressed, transferring to and from my wheelchair, and navigating inaccessible spaces. In addition to mundane activities of daily living, uh, I've had to deal with quite a bit. I've been stuck in snow drifts and ice. I've had aides get me out of beds for unexpected fire drills. I've had aides run upstairs to talk to professors on my behalf when an elevator's been broken. We, we, we've had a lot. Um, and I've been able to live a more self-determined, independent life. And I was able to partake for the better part of two and a half years, uh, all that college life had to offer. Well, except this past year, I've been back living with my folks and I love them, but I'm so looking forward to getting back to campus and plan my future for post-graduation. So how would more investments in home community-based services affect me? It hasn't been easy, but this uh, legislation will make it easier. Um, it'll allow me to pay care staff a uh, livable and competitive wage and improve, and improve retention. I have to deal a lot of turnover, including the four staff members I have with me currently. I've been uh, through 11 caregivers in the past three years. Most of them graduate. Some leave for a better paying job. But either way, I'm always recruiting and they deserve to be paid fairly for their work. Uh, more competitive wages will allow me to recruit staff who'll stay longer um, beyond college students. Most are looking for work-related experience. That's how I find them. And most will only stay one to two years, uh, but they become a part of your family. Uh, many of people who've worked with me are gonna be my friends for life. and. They've said the experience helps them become better nurses, teachers, therapists, as well as human beings. And if I'm able to pay them more money, I'll spend less time recruiting and training people. In fact, there are two staff that are, that are leaving in August. So I'm looking again for more staff and all this recruiting and training just simply takes more time and I hope more investment into these programs means that we could pay overtime because during the summertime, I have staff who want to work, you know, 20 hours or more a week, but our programs don't fund overtime pay. So I have to rely on my parents to fill in the gaps in the schedule. I want to continue to be more independent as I possibly can and give back to society and the greater economy by holding a job and stimulating things that way. And this act would help make it possible. If there's anything um, I can do to advocate for this bill more, please let me know. It's been a privilege to be here. And I'd like to thank Congresswoman Dingell as well as Senators Duckworth and Casey.
Thank you, Colin. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We're so grateful for your advocacy on this issue. We, you know, we're all working together. Um, and you really highlighted how important this bill is for not just you and other people with disabilities, but also for the workers um, and, and, you know, who do become part of our family. And that is, that is so key. So thank you so much, Colin. Um, and now I'm, I'm really excited to turn this over to Victoria. Victoria is the uh, community coordinator of Pennsylvania Families Need Nurses Now. She is also a fellow mom of a disabled child. Her son, Cole, is five years old and loves music and dancing and adventures. Um, and he's just the cutest little thing ever. Uh, he's been receiving home and community-based services since he came home from the NICU, from the neonatal intensive care unit since he was four months old, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so Victoria is here to share her family's experience with us. Thank you, Victoria, welcome. Thank you so much for having me this evening. I'd like to say thank you to you first, Elena, for this opportunity. It's a privilege as a, a family member to be able to be here this evening, to even be able to share our story because so many times families like ours don't have the support that we need to be able to step away and use our voice to speak about these issues. I'd also like to express my deepest gratitude to Senators Casey and Duckworth and Congresswoman Dingell for their hard work and dedication to the Better Care, Better uh, Jobs Act and their unwavering advocacy for the disability community. As Elena said, my name is Victoria and my son is Cole, who is five. He's intelligent, hilarious, curious, full of life, and he thinks he's the first person in the world to have discovered Mario, Donkey Kong, and Sonic, and can't fathom how mommy possibly knows these things because I'm too old. Um, as of today, he would tell you that when he grows up, he dreams of being Mario, and a plumber, and a nurse, and a child life specialist. And I'm here today to talk to you about those dreams and the reason he is able to hope and plan for the future, and that's because because of home and community-based services. Cole was born with mitochondrial disease. And while he's a bug expert and a budding astronomer, he also faces very difficult health challenges every single day. And because of the mitochondrial disease, he has intestinal failure and requires a special IV and his heart called a Broviac to deliver the nutrition and hydration he even needs to survive. He has tubes in his stomach and intestines. He lives with epilepsy, hypoglycemia, chronic kidney disease, hypogammaglobulinemia, and muscle weakness, just to name a few. He requires hospital level care to tend to his medical needs, but thanks to home and community-based services like skilled nursing, he's able to receive that care at home with us and remain an active part of his community. Our nurses are the very keystone of our lives. Like Colin said, they become family. They provide skilled care for cold day and night. Um, they do continuous assessments, medical interventions, emergency care, medication administration, seizure care, infection control, the list could go on forever. They also attend all of his appointments. We have 30 specialists and four therapists, so we're pretty busy <laughs> traveling to appointments and they're there for all of them. They follow his therapy plans, track his goals, they interact and play with him. They help access his education for him in the way that any other five-year-old could. Home care nurses are really just one example of how home care and health care are infrastructure. You know, they really bring skilled care of a hospital right into my home and into our community. And if hospitals are infrastructure, then hospital care at home is also infrastructure. It's the way the disability community is able to access the care that they need while remaining part of their community, which as we've been talking about is so important. In our home, our nurses make it possible for Cole to thrive, to attend events, and to take part in day-to-day -day activities like visiting the zoo or playing t-ball. And so many people take those things for granted. Home care nurses also don't have a button on a wall to push when Cole's having a seizure, you know, with a cavalry of specialists to run in to help attend to the emergency. They have to act as a respiratory therapist, a neurologist, and provide the care of five or six different people all by themselves. And you know what they always, always do. And while home care nurses provide the services and care of an entire medical team solo, they're not compensated nearly at the level of their hospital or skilled facility peers. And they lack the support necessary to even be able to do their jobs. And as a society, we significantly undervalue the life-sustaining services that home care nurses provide that allow me to keep Cole at home. 
and there's a severe nationwide shortage of qualified home care nurses, which means families like mine are left without the help and care that we really desperately need. For example, just this month alone, I have 328 hours of the 528 hours he's authorized for that aren't staffed. That's 328 hours I'm left to try to provide the care of a skilled licensed nurse on my own. 328 hours I'm his sole medical provider night and day with no breaks, no sleep, and no ability to provide anything other than medical care and ensure that he stays safe, which is of course my priority. But my story sadly isn't very unique. There are millions of families across this country who face the same or even worse challenges because there are many people who don't qualify for these services under current laws. And that's just a shame. You know, the nurses who provide this care are a unicorn all of their own. They have to be critical thinkers, quick on their feet, compassionate, flexible, willing to become part of our families and overlook the chaos of our daily lives, constantly learning and growing and they work just as hard as their hospital counterparts and have an even greater responsibility load. Not only do they deserve our support because they are providing a service that keeps our families together, but they do so in a way that makes our communities more fulfilled and stronger because everyone is given the same access. For us, that looks like being able to take our first family vacation to the beach, seeing his first movie in theaters together, going on a play date with friends, getting to spend time together as a family and just be parents. And being completely honest, me being able to care for myself by going to my own doctor appointments or having a normal sleep schedule, what's that? <laughs> and knowing he's safe and in the hands of someone who will care for and protect him and keep him safe. And honestly, the ripple effect of not being able to care for ourselves as caregivers not only impacts us as a family, but it becomes costly in a financial way. And when children like Cole have consistent home health care nurses, it means that it's possible to leave home. Even with all of his medical equipment, medications, and therapies, it means driving with him or going to the park can be a safe activity because thanks to his nurses, we can stay ahead of crises, handle them as they come, and continue to allow him to do everything he loves. You know, what if he has a seizure while I'm driving or his blood sugar crashes? Thanks to these nurses, we stay ahead of all of that. Investing in home and community-based services is vital to our society as a whole. It means getting my loved one and maybe someday your loved one out of hospitals and facilities and keeping them home with us where they belong. It means keeping families together, strengthening bonds, keeping parents in the workforce and giving every, everyone equal access to pursuing their passions and dreams. You know, Cole may never grow up to be Mario, but he definitely deserves to grow up and chase whatever dreams he has, just like everyone does. His medical issues will only hold him back if he can't access the care he needs to thrive. Home care and health care are infrastructure. They are the foundation that holds families and communities together and the bricks that community life is built on. They are not just a need, but they're definitely a right for all. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. That was so powerful. You're absolutely right. And you really bring it all together that we're here to support not just our family members, but supporting caregivers and supporting home workers, including home nurses. And that is that is so, so important. Uh, I am so grateful that we've had the chance to have this conversation, to hear from those who are directly affected um, and who will benefit from this $400 billion investment in home and community-based services. Um, we have a little bit more time, so I would like to toss out this question um, to, to our members of Congress. Um, we are hearing from the community. Uh, so Senator Casey, Senator uh, Duckworth, and Congresswoman Dingell, if you can help guide us. Um, what can we do? What can those who are listening right now, what can we do to help make sure that Congress passes Better Care, Better Jobs Act to help ensure that we invest in home and community-based services? Can you, can you give us a, a to-do list, if you will, um, so our families can get to work and, and work together and, and, and support this? Tell the stories. Tell your stories. Let me tell you when the Republicans were attacking the Affordable Care Act that long, hot summer, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that fight that we finally won because we split uh, three Republicans. It was because families came and told their stories and, and over and over and over again that if you do this, you're going to, this. my, my child will die. And, and, and that's the bottom line. And so tell your stories over and over and over again so that 
you know, if you have senators like Senator Casey and myself and a representative like uh, the wonderful uh, uh, Representative Dingo who supports you, tell us, tell your stories anyway. If you have someone who doesn't, go tell them, try to convince them, and we will work with them as well so that we can also go on the floor and say, listen, I've received 3,000 points of touch from my constituents on this issue this month. This is important to the people of Illinois. And so that's the biggest thing you can do is just to continue to tell your story and reach out, send those emails, um, make sure that those who represent you understand how vitally important this is. Elena, can I, can I just do something very briefly? Of course, of course I do. I'm going to incorporate by reference every single word that Tammy Duckworth just uttered, and that is my answer. <laughs> no, but that's true. It's tell your story. And I, I'm so grateful to have been um, not only a part of this call, but to, to have heard uh, the personal testimony that, that we heard of Victoria. Um, I've never been prouder to represent someone than I was listening to your story. And... Um, those, those are the stories that are going to move people to get this done. So we're grateful you're willing to bring your story and the, 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 the challenges that you face every day as a mom, as a, as a caregiver, as an advocate, bringing those stories to us and to so many other Americans um, in this, on this platform, so to speak, and to a, a wider audience is so important. We're grateful you're willing to share it. I'm, my two colleagues said it so eloquently, I can't, but I, I would expand, not only tell your stories to senators and to members of Congress, but talk to local media, talk to people and help get your story out there in forms where other people can become part of this army. And they realize, they hear your personal stories. Your stories are what make the difference. All right, friends, so that is our call to action to tell our stories and continue telling our stories. We can do this. This is a life changing once in a generation opportunity and we must take it. We can do this. We will do this. I am so grateful and I am hopeful that we can do right by our children. We can do right by our caregivers, um, do right by our domestic workers and home care, home health care workers, many of them women and immigrants and black and brown workers who work so hard to care for our loved ones. Um, and I just want to say thank you again. We're going to wrap up the top of the hour. Thank you, Senator Casey. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Congresswoman Dingle, for your leadership and your partnership throughout this. Thank you to Colin and Victoria uh, for sharing your story with us, for helping us put a face on this very, very important issue to all the advocates and organizations, um, everyone who's worked on this. I am so grateful for you all, um, and we'll, we will get this done. Thank you to Brad and Will at Social Security Work uh, and the whole team there for putting this event together. I uh, wish you all good health and we will talk soon again. Thanks everybody. Thank you.